Hello there, I'm Manish Shekhar and welcome to the Global Dialogue series on Neurodiversity. Neurodiversity embraces how we all think, learn, communicate and experience the world differently from one another. In this podcast, every fortnight, we talk with different people to showcase how we are accepting the diversity of human brain and mind in different parts of the world and the need for inclusion of all individuals with different cognitive abilities into the mainstream society. Our guest today is Ian Perkis, an autistic and non-binary author, public speaker and community leader who also has the diagnosis of schizophrenia and works in the autism, neurodiversity, gender diversity and mental health advocacy space. Ian is the author of 10 published books on elements of autism and is a regular blogger. They were named the 2016 ACT Volunteer of the Year and received the ACT Chief Minister's Inclusion Award for Achievement in Inclusion in 2019. Ian is also a prolific public speaker and has presented at a range of events including TEDx Canberra in 2013. Hi, and thank you so much for joining our global dialogue series on neurodiversity. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Could you give me a few words about yourself for our audience today? Thank you, certainly. My name is Yen Perkis. I'm an autistic and non-binary author and advocate. I'm based in Australia, and I've been working in the autism advocacy space since uh, 2005. That's really great. You know, um, when, when I spoke with you the first time, like um, it was really inspiring to see how your journey has been and how you've been optimistic and kept moving forward to achieve your goals. What has been your key motivator? I mean, I think a lot of people will be inspired to listen to that. Thank you. Yes. The thing is, I have the kind of life that should not really lead to optimism. I have a very difficult life. Um, I'm autistic and that isn't really a difficulty, it's just a difference. But I also have schizophrenia and generalised anxiety disorder and depression and those things make my life very difficult. And when I first started out, when I was a young adult, um, life was extremely hard. I got involved with some really dangerous people and ended up in prison and had all these really dreadful things happen. And I was very negative. I didn't have a lot of positivity going on in my life at all. And I found myself at the age of 25 realising I wanted to change my life and I decided that I wanted to be what I called ordinary. Now, to my mind, that sounds awful, but it isn't. To my mind, being ordinary involved getting an education, a job, a mortgage and a suit and I thought that's the things that most people have I want that too and so I set out on this amazing journey uh, to go from being unemployable to being a career public servant in government administration to being a 10 times published author to being somebody who is very positive and focuses on doing the right thing and focuses on supporting people I always say I'm an extremely ethical person with a very unethical history And that has pushed me and motivated me to make a difference, not just for my life, but for other people's. And in terms of my autism advocacy, I used to, so I wrote my first book, which is an autobiography called Finding a Different Kind of Normal. And I wrote that in um, 2005. And I didn't really do much in the advocacy space. I did the occasional conference talk, a few schools, things like that. I didn't really didn't really feel I owed anything to the autism community to to spend my time doing things. And then when I was um, in 2012, I met this young man who was autistic. And when I told him that I was autistic and that I worked in government administration and that I had published a book, he said, no, that's not possible. You're lying. And it's not very nice having your whole life dismissed. But the thing was, for this young man, my life was a lie. It was not possible for him because every conversation he'd had around autism had centred on what he couldn't do, his lack of capability, that he needed lots of support, that he couldn't live independently, all of these things. And that got me thinking, it is one person like that. There must be a bunch of people like that. And that's not a good thing. To my mind, an early diagnosis of autism should lead to positive things. It should lead to you getting support and empowerment and being, you know, proud of who you are and all of those things, having positive self-knowledge and identity. But for this young man, it hadn't. It was quite the opposite. And that absolutely catapulted me into the advocacy world and almost as soon 
as I met that person, I wrote my second book, which is called The Wonderful World of Work, and it's an employment book for autistic teenagers to prepare them for the workforce. And since then, I've been very motivated in particularly the neurodiversity advocacy space, but more recently in the gender diversity space, mental health, all of those things. So I'm a very motivated person because I want to change the world. I can't change all the world. I'm not that clever, but I can change the bits of the world that I'm in and I can make more positives to the world. And as I say, I am a very ethical person with a very unethical past. And so a lot of what I do even now is to put distance between that past and who I am now and to make a better world for for other people as well. That's really, really nice. And what I really like about you is how you want to change the world. And what you said about, uh, you know, how we talk about autism, we actually talk, there's a lot of negativity, what we cannot do. And changing the perspective and cha- changing the narration is how what positive things can come out of it right especially like your title of your book the new normal what how what were your thought process when you wrote that book the book was amazing because i wasn't going to write a book so in 2005 i was doing my master's degree in visual arts in melbourne in australia And I did a lot of artwork that was sort of contemporary and a bit out there. And I did a lot of text, lots of writing. And I had this really quirky writing style. I'd never written anything except in high school English and university essays. Never actually written a book or anything like that. But while I was doing all these artworks with with writing, um, lots of people said, you need to write your life story. It's really interesting and you write really nicely. And I just said, no, I wouldn't do that in a million years. I can't think of anything worse than opening myself up to criticism by talking about all my grim and gory details of my horrible life. And then shortly after that, um, when I was absolutely determined not to write my life story, I met Polly Samuel, who also was known as Donna Williams. Now, Polly was probably one of the most famous autistic people in the world. Um, she wrote an autobi- she wrote a few autobiographies, but the first two were international bestsellers, which catapulted her from poverty into wealth, changed her whole out. She became world famous. She was the first person to write an autistic autobiography. And through a number of situations, I ended up becoming friends with Polly. And Polly changed my life. There are people in my life who are catalysts for positive change and for negative change. And Polly was definitely the positive change. She really made a big difference to me. And one of the first things Polly said to me was, Yen, you need to write your life story. And I said, no, I've been through this. I'm not doing it. And she said, well, I give talks to parents quite a lot. And usually when I'm giving talks to parents, there's a couple at the back of the room and they um, sit there and they leave before the end. They don't stay for the questions. They don't stay for the cup of tea. Those are the parents of the autistic kids who are in trouble with the law and they're ashamed to talk about their children. If you wrote your autobiography, those parents would be who it was for. And, of course, I realised that that was my parents. And so I set about the process of writing a book. I'd never written a book. I didn't know how to write books, so I'd never sort of thought I needed to do one. Um, I remember when I first started it, so I had it in my brain that I was going to do this, but I hadn't started it yet. I had a friend staying over and I lived in this tiny little flat with a fold-out couch. And so my friend was on the couch and I woke up and she slept in until like 10 o'clock in the morning and I was in my bedroom and I didn't want to go and wake her up. And I had my computer, it was in my bedroom. And I thought, hmm, I should probably write that book. Um, and so I started and I just started writing this thing and it just grew from there. And it took four weeks to write. It's the quickest thing I've ever done. It was very cathartic. I had to write that book. As soon as I started, I couldn't stop. Um, My uni got a bit neglected for a while. My master's degree got a little bit neglected because I was busy writing the book. And so I finished writing the book and showed it to Polly and she did some lovely editing and she wrote... um, a foreword for it which is still if you buy a copy of it now the foreword's still in there and um yeah and then she sent it to her publisher which is now my main publisher I've got three but this is the one I publish mostly with and she said look my friend Yen's written this great book um 
you know, we're sending it to you for your consideration. And three weeks later, the publisher got back to me, the CEO of the publisher got back to me and said, yep, we want this. And my life changed. Um, I never became super wealthy because of books. I, I get pocket money, basically. But wealth is not important. What the book gave me was so much confidence in myself. And it actually did give me wealth because three months after that book came out, I applied for a graduate job in the public service, which there's no way I would have done if I hadn't written that book. And so actually, the book has been really helpful for a lot of people. But I think that one is the one of my books that's been more helpful to me than anyone else who's, who's read it. Um, and I love that thing. It changed my life. I, I, um, I've got the copy. I've got the first copy that I was sent and I still got it on my bookshelf. And in fact, I've got all my books on my bookshelf. As soon as I get sent the author copies, I pop them up there. So I've got, I think I've got 22 at the moment, including all the ones that I've contributed to. Um, and I love them. I love the books. I call them my paper children. Other people love them too, which is what it's about, really. There's no point the author thinking they're great if nobody else does. But um, the first one absolutely changed my life. I I love that book. Um, and I wouldn't be doing the things I'm doing if it wasn't for that book and if it wasn't for Polly. And sadly, Polly passed away a few years ago um, from cancer, which was really a big loss for the autism community and a big loss for me. I'm really sorry to hear that. But I'm glad she pushed you to write the book because I can see from hearing you, I can see how much it has changed and I'm pretty sure how much it will impact others' life. And I think as Polly mentioned, I, we need role models. We need people to, we need stories to relate to, right? Those are important. And I know that you've been working with a lot of parents and neurodiverse individuals, right? So what is the situation now? How, how are people taking it forward? Look, it's lovely. It's absolutely lovely at the moment. There's so many people in this space doing amazing things and so many young people. I'm always delighted when I see young neurodivergent kids and young adults and teenagers doing advocacy. It's just fantastic. And I do think maybe one day I'll get to retire. Um, but I think things in the past, so I've been doing this for what, 17 years. And in that time, things have changed radically. Things are so different. Um, I remember there's a politician in Australia whose name I won't mention because she's not very nice, but a few years ago she came out and uh, said a whole bunch of mean things about autistic kids. And I'm a government official, so I can't make public commentary on uh, political things, and so I couldn't comment on this. And I didn't need to because everyone else did. Whereas, you know, 15 years ago, the difference with parents, so it used to be if I was talking to non-autistic parents, there would be an issue always that they'd be patronising or they'd be negative or they'd think their child was a burden or they'd be grieving for the child they didn't get and they got the autistic one and they didn't want them. That was very, very common. Whereas now for a parent to behave like that is considered amongst the entire community, including the non-autistic parent community to not be okay. And so things have really moved on in the 17 years that I've been doing this for, which is lovely. You should never be complacent though. I think one of the things about advocacy is that you have to be really careful not to think, oh, well, things are going better now so we can stop with the momentum. We can just let it go and everything will just improve. That's never the case. Things do not naturally get better. Things get better because of agents of change and because of people in the world, you know, standing up and being counted. So it's really important. It's lovely that things are different now. It's lovely that there's more understanding of autism. So in my lifetime, so not just when I've been an advocate, but since I was diagnosed in 1994, the difference in understanding has increased a lot. So when I first was diagnosed, I didn't know what autism was and nobody else did. And then a few years after that, people would say, oh, I've heard of that. They wouldn't know anything about it, but I've heard of that. And then they'd say, oh, I know somebody who's, who is autistic. 
And now people who don't have any reason to know much about autism are actually quite educated. And then there's like neurodiversity. So a lot of people will describe themselves not as autistic or ADHD or dyslexic, but as neurodivergent. And that's a recent thing that I've seen, which I actually quite like. Although I like my autism and ADHD diagnoses as well. But I do like... I like that broader idea of a neurodivergent community. Um, I think that's quite lovely and that's an emerging thing. And the gender diversity and the concept of autigender, which is like a neurotype that's autistic and gender divergent. So all of those things, it's great. All this stuff's evolving and changing and, and people's knowledge is growing, which I think is just lovely. Really nice to hear how you have iterated the shift, the positive shift about autism through the years now and like you said I think advocacy matters and continuously advocating advocating for new changes new perspectives important I think um, in our group Esther we were discussing about the puzzle symbol versus the infinity symbol what's your personal opinion on that I don't like the puzzle I know some people like the puzzle and that is their business they can like it if they want to but I find it um it sort of says to me I'm a puzzle that needs to be solved. It's like autism is confusing and difficult and challenging and so we're a puzzle and we need solving. Whereas the infinity symbol is much more grown out of the neurodiversity movement. It's, to my mind, a lot more inclusive, a lot more respectful. But as I say, not all autistic people will agree with that. Some autistic people do use the puzzle piece and they've got other explanations for what it means to them. But for me, it always reminds me of going to parent groups in the past and they've got that puzzle and I feel like oh I'm a missing piece I don't want to be a missing piece there's a whole idea of the changeling you know there's it's very insulting things for autistic people so I personally am definitely the rainbow neurodiversity symbol I've got a book called the trans autistic guide to life was it the autistic trans guide to life? I never remember. And the image on the cover is the infinity symbol in the trans flag colours, which I absolutely love. And I want to get myself a little badge like that. I might have to get clever with graphic design and make one myself. But I do like that because infinity, you know, it's it's forever and um, it, it's infinite possibilities and it's infinite identities and I, I do really like it. And as you can probably tell from what I'm wearing, I'm a big rainbow fan, so I'm um, non-binary and I'm asexual, so I definitely consider myself part of the LGBTQ plus umbrella and, I mean, I know rainbow is gay rather than as a specific um, signifier, but I, I've, in, I've embraced rainbow because I really like it. Um, and these are Lego. They actually are little Lego bricks and you can take them off. <laughs> okay. And now talking about workplace, right, uh, what does resil- resilience mean for neurodiverse individuals in a workplace? And, I mean, there's a lot of challenges. Right? You definitely need a lot of resilience to go through it. Could you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. So as I say, I work in government administration. For me, it was quite a journey to that workplace that I'm in now. Um, Work can be really challenging. A lot of the stuff that happens with workplaces and autistic people is a lack of understanding. I was just in a presentation today about interviews and recruitment processes and I kept thinking yep for autistic people all of this is really hard Um, there can be sensory issues in the workplace the lights can be really bright there can be noise there can be smells Um, some people just don't get you I've had colleagues and managers who just do not understand where I'm coming from which makes work very challenging thankfully at the moment everyone's super lovely and they have been for some years so that's good but I know a number of neurodivergent people who cannot work at all and it's not because they don't want to it's not because they're slack or they're lazy it's just that the whole process of applying for a job going through recruitment processes and being employed is really challenging and I think we need to educate employers and managers about autism and what it means and that if you have an autistic staff member, that's not a bad thing. That can actually be a really good thing. Um, I have a manager who says I do the work of two people um, and I do. I work very hard. My work ethic is off the chart. Um, I love my job. I'm very grateful for my job. 
And so, you know, any manager would be glad to have me. But I think a lot of managers, if they're told, you know, this person's autistic, I think, oh, that's just going to be difficult adjustments that I'll need to make and it's going to be they might not get along with the team and all of these things. So I think that that level of understanding for managers and for colleagues is really important as well as autistic people themselves becoming job ready uh, you know with um, with employment service provision um, and I've worked in the policy space here you get the two things you get the person being work ready and able to do the job and then you get the workplace being inclusive and supporting that person if you have both of those things at the same time it can make the world of work a lot easier to navigate that's really, really nice. And when you talk about autism, it's a spectrum. You have all types of people. And what I've seen like quite in the past years is that we mostly talk about people who can communicate, but what about people who are non-verbal, who cannot communicate? How do they get into the workplace and how can we shift towards that? I think that's really important. And I am aware as a verbal autistic person that I do not speak for non-verbal, non-speaking autistic people uh, because that is not my experience, um, apart from sometimes when I'm psychotic, I'm non-verbal, but that's a mental health thing rather than an autism thing. Um, and I think it is really important to include people um, who are non-speakers in all aspects of life. And there's no reason they can't be. I think with non-speaking, people have this whole assumption that that person can't contribute to society, they can't be involved, they can't do anything, which is absolutely not true. There's a number of um, non-speakers who, I mean, I know a couple that are giving TED Talks. Um, you know, most people can't give a TED Talk. So those skills that someone would have, um, translate just as much for a non-speaker as for somebody who uses verbal speech. Um, I think often it's important in that situation to have support in order to look for and find work. And it is definitely a piece to be taken to employers um, and, you know, a case made that this person's going to be really good. So often that does require a bit of flexibility on behalf of the employer, which employing anyone does. You know, employing any staff member can need and require flexibility and understanding and things like that. But I think it is really important to remember that our non-speaking colleagues um, have as much or more to add to the world of work than anyone else does. It's just a matter of finding a workplace environment that is appropriate and supportive and, and enables that person to shine. Um, there's a fantastic fellow in the US called Patrick Schwartz, who's an employment specialist and he's also an ADHDer. And um, he works in that space of placing um, employees with workplaces that others have said, oh, no, that's too hard. And I think sometimes for non-speakers there is that assumption that it's too hard, which there shouldn't be. Um, but sometimes we need to, to think outside the square and, um, you know, be inclusive of, of other people and to benefit them and also their workplace. That's so true. And the assumption of too hard, I think um, maybe is a thought, like, whether you're non-verbal or verbal, I think your communication style changes. And I think uh, everybody has a different, different communication style, right? If you understand the way, communication can be more than just words, can it not? And how does this matter for an autistic individual? And what would you say about this? Yeah, I think communication is the primary difference between autistic and neurotypical. I think that is the primary difference is different ways of communicating. And a number of the other things related to autism, the autistic characteristics that people talk about, all of them or many of them stem from that basis of communication differences. I talk about culture. I talk about autistic culture and how it's almost like autistic people are expatriates in another country. And the people in that country don't speak the same language. And so the autistic people have to learn the language of the people in their adopted country. And instead of people thinking, you know, this person doesn't speak my language, so they have to learn it, they think, oh, this person speaks my language really badly. And that seems to me the difference with communication. It's that assumption that we're doing it wrong rather than autistic people communicate differently and their communication is equally valid. And a lot of my work involves just that, 
you know, teaching people that it is like a cultural difference. And also, as an autistic person, when I visit in that country and somebody from my country, from the land of autism, comes and visits me, I'm at home. Uh, it's, it's like when you are in a different country and someone comes from where you're from, then it's just lovely because you can talk in your own language and you don't have to worry about not understanding their communication and where they're coming from. But I think that that communication difference is to my mind, the biggest difference between autistic and neurotypical people. Um, and it is a challenge to educate neurotypical people that our, you know, our language is different, but our language is equally valid. That's really, really nice. Like the way you, the, the analogy that you gave as a cultural difference, right? And then it starts, we start looking at a more positive way. It's not a negative. It's like, there's a difference and we're trying to open and accept their culture. There's more than one way of thinking. And that's what neurodiversity ma means, right? There's more than one way of thought processes. Thank you, Anne, for so much, for such an interesting conversation of talking about how the advocacy has impacted the autism community and giving us such a different way to look at neurodiversity and autism together. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to this conversation? I don't know, just that life can be really good, life can be really hard, and just be you, I guess. Um, whether you're autistic or neurotypical or, or whatever else, um, yeah, just just be yourself and, and know that you have a lot to offer the world, whatever you might think. And, um, yeah, it gets better. People often say to me, what would you say to your 15-year-old self? There's a couple of things I'd say to my 15-year-old self. One of them would be come to one of my presentations and sit in the front row. The other thing I would say is it gets better. It doesn't get, in, it like, incrementally better. It sort of goes up and down. But the older you get, the more you learn who you are and how you communicate and how you fit in the world and who you want to be. And that knowing, I mean, for me, when I decided to be ordinary, that was a really pivotal moment in my life because I realised I had some agency. I was in charge of what happened in my life. I drove the car. I was in the driver's seat. That was all up to me. And I was in charge and I did. I achieved the things within eight years I achieved that goal. I'm not one of those dreadful, not dreadful, but I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm not going to say if you do this you'll get wealthy or anything. But I will say that life does change and those pivotal moments can be really important. So um, if it feels right, do it. That's so true. And uh, like as you say, Try to be you rather than trying to fit to the world. Try to make you fit. Like, don't fit to the world. First, understand who you are is so much more important, right? Thank you, Anne, for joining our conversation today. Hope you have a great day. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this one. It's actually six o'clock in the evening, my time. I had an early dinner. I called my dad. Um, and, yeah, I'm going to post a blog after I finish here. And, um, yeah, it'll all be good. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to our Global Dialogue series on neurodiversity. Our next episode will be on 19th April with Grace, researcher and director of Autism Lab in Simon Fraser University, Canada. In our upcoming conversation, Grace talks about the shift in academic research about neurodiversity and autism. Till then, take care and have a great week.